I was born in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. I grew up in a suburban Cleveland, Ohio. The town is Berea. Uh, I went to college at Princeton in New Jersey. I went to medical school at the University of Michigan. And I've sort of hopscotched around since then and ended up in Concord. Allentown, Pennsylvania, actually from Easton, Pennsylvania, but Allentown's the bigger town of those three. Uh, I that's where I went to college, and, and that's where I li we lived most of the time after I got out of, out of high school. I lived outside of Philadelphia. I was born in Grassmere, New Hampshire. But as, things are, as far as I can remember, I was, lived in Bowl for 10 years. Well, I guess I would have to start with the fact that I grew up in Lower Bosquin in the 40s, 1940s and 50s, and we always felt in Lower Bosquin that we were part of Pentecost. I had a good life in Concord, really. Uh, born in 1929, not such a good time, the Great Depression. Well, I was actually born in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1934. Uh, but I, my early years in Quincy were just up to like a couple, two, three years. And then I ended up moving, well, the family moved, to, relocated to Salem, Mass. Well, I was born in Oil City, Pennsylvania, a little tiny town in northwest Pennsylvania, and um, went on to Penn State University, went back to my hometown and taught high school for a while, and then I took a position with Jostens American Yearbook Company. I had entered New Hampshire in 1962 as an immigrant. My hometown is Montreal. I was born in 1927 in Concord. My father and mother were born in Concord. My grandmother and grandfather were born in Concord. Most of us stayed here in Concord. I grew up in East Concord. Well, I was born here and um, I went to all the schools, as did my siblings. I was born in Schenectady, New York. Now, the, uh, that's a difficult uh, word to spell. The name of that city is so difficult that I remember trying to learn it when I was young. Well, I was born and brought up in Concord. I was a South Ender, still am a South Ender. And that's actually where I was born, was in the uh, uh, Memorial Building and that's before Concord Hospital uh, was merged with Memorial and Pillsbury and that great big area up uh, where Concord Hospital is now. So my life in connection with Concord really has to do with my family that I became a part of. Uh, when, we, when I was married the second time, we came to see this beautiful land up here, saw how, how it welcoming it was to us when we came here and decided to make it part of our lives. Well, my uh, life in Concord began in 1969. So I lived in the northern part of the state first and was a teacher at the Whitefield School, which was a K through 12. I also had the opportunity while living in the North Country to be the first Head Start teacher and the first kindergarten teacher at Whitefield School. I left the North Country and then went to Salem where I was offered a position to be the director of a private school and I held that position for two years and then was invited to come to Concord to serve in state government as a consultant to the Title I uh, office in the Division of Instruction in the New Hampshire Department of Education. And that was 1969, July 1, 1969, I began my job and in September 1969, I moved my family to Concord. I came to Concord when I was almost 10 and I came with an aunt from England. She had come to visit because um, it was after the war and she came with trunks of canned produce. They lived on a farm and she canned hams and chickens and all kinds of vegetables and she put them in trunks and she hauled them across the, the Atlantic and uh, to distribute amongst the various of her relative. The first thing I remember about a connection to Concord was uh, on a September day in 1938. My father at the time worked for General Ice Cream Corporation in Providence, Rhode Island. And we were driving up to Concord to visit his oldest sister who lived here with her family. We were overtaken by the 1938 hurricane along the way. So it was a, a pretty exciting drive up. And of course the devastation in Concord the next morning was just incredible to see. Um, 
One of the Boston and Maine passenger trains had had to be abandoned and they happened to live close to the track. So the son and myself had a wonderful time roaming around the Boston and Maine train. At 18, I went upon the U.S. General William Mitchell, a large transport ship that carried 4,000 soldiers plus. On the ship, there was a chaplain, and he was primarily there for the soldiers and the Marines who were going to battle. And, um, but he was permanent with us, and the other chaplains would come with them, but he, he was in charge. And um, uh, in the course of the you know, times there, when I was free, we'd go to church uh, on the deck. They had a portable organ, and we'd go and sing some hymns, and the uh, captain would start to come in, and when he got there, the service started. I couldn't start without him, captain ship. So we, we um, uh, one day, we was out in the North Pacific, in a typhoon. In order to have the church service that Sunday, uh, just before the storm hit us, the waves and the wind were such that the uh, poor organist uh, couldn't play the organ because it was on wheels, it's portable, and the darn thing kept trying to roll over him. The chaplain asked me to hold, the ch so I spent the whole service uh, leaning on the, uh, the organ so it wouldn't uh, just roll away. So, but in that service, Here's the wind blowing and the ship bounding up and down. The might of God was just so impressive. And I think that was the point where I really got to thinking about um, becoming a minister. When I was in college, when I went to college, and I was older, having been in the service, and had to go back to high school and finish high school before I go to college after the war. And um, there were these three little churches that needed a minister and it worked out. I was licensed as a minister. This was before I was ordained and even in seminary. So I had these three little churches for four years. And just uh, that, that entered me into the ministry. And then I moved, was called to New Hampshire, where for 18 years I served as the executive minister for the New York, uh, the American Baptist churches. So what a wonderful ministry I had, which I'm grateful for. I arrived in Concord, New Hampshire in 1976. So I have been here a long time. I've been here longer as an adult than I actually from my hometown. So it really feels like it is my town. Actually, I came down from the Northern Railway from White River to Concord to attend business school. I was recruited for a two-year business school here in Pierce College. I came here to uh, go to law go to law school when they first opened the what is now UNH Law School. It was known as Franklin Pierce uh, Law Center, and that was up on Pleasant Street. Uh, the building is no longer there because I think we played so much hard ping pong games that I think we. <laughs> practically wrecked the building on the third floor. I came here in 1973 and Concord was a pretty small town of 30,000 people and really wasn't a Boston sub suburb. It was more or less a, uh, you know, a city on its own. My family and I, we moved back here on a long-term basis in 1986. I had been uh, in Houston working for a Fortune 500 company and I was traveling all the time. And um, I was flying back over the States, uh, one time coming back from Saudi Arabia. And I looked down at all these peaceful little communities. Uh, you can see the lights going by. And I'm thinking, you know, my life is just like a merry-go-round. I'm back and forth and I'm not seeing the kids. And it's just time to make a change. We sort of checked around. The schools were great, which was important for us with a new family. So here's this boy who was looking all around the U.S., deciding to come to northern New England, where I really had no roots, but uh, settled here and have been here ever since. Now, almost 40 years. Con Concord was perfect. New Hampshire was great because of the tax situation to me, and I needed to be somewhere where I could be everywhere in New England, really, pretty much within two or three hours. Uh, but Concord is right at the intersection of 89 and 93, great for transportation and the school system was great, which was important to us. We wanted our daughters to go to private, public school and uh, we wanted to find a system that we trusted. So this turned out to be good for a lot of reasons.
My parents were middle class, working. My father was a salesman in the furniture business for Lincoln's Furniture, a, a Yankee furniture store on Pleasant Street, 26 Pleasant Street. And my mother was a telephone operator and we lived on uh, Martin Street. I went to elementary school in what was the old Pinnacle Academy in Lower Bosquin and is now currently the uh, town office. And that building was um, renovated and so forth, so it looks like it did in the old days. I grew up right in on Airport Road in Concord. I lived on the corner of Airport Road and uh, Old Turnpike Road. I've lived in several places in Concord, but one of them was Marshall Street. But the really important part of that is growing up, that is right next to the state hospital. So I really, where we played most of the time was in the state hospital. My first job, I was 10 years old. I worked on a poultry farm and I, uh, uh, I got 50 cents an hour and I was happy. I got that 50 cents boy and I, uh, uh, I saved up my money, and I, the first thing I bought was a shotgun so I could go hunting. I was 12 years old by the time I got it. In those days, the uh, students were used as crossing guards, so I was bigger than most kids, and uh, when I became captain of the crossing guards, uh, that gave me a Sam Brown belt made of uh, canvas with a badge with a red circle on it. The crossing guards had blue circles but I was in charge of uh, getting the other students to help the children cross the street for the occasional car that came along. Uh, they had to uh, let me out of detention to go do my crossing guard duties. Playing at West Street Park and Rollins Park, those were our two main uh, parks of play. We uh, had great memories of the Conant School area, and back then uh, Conant School was the biggest school, everybody walked to school. No such thing as a ride. Uh, later on, you brought your bikes to school and the bike rack was always full of bikes. I've seen a lot of changes on the, on the heights though. Wow, compared, now compared to then was unbelievable. And then I went to Rumford School, and then I went to the Parker School, and then I went to the old Rumford Junior High School and then went to high school. And of course the high school was just that long building that went. I decided one day to drive my brother's car. He had gone into the army and he left his car at home and, and uh, at Marshall Street. And I thought, you know, I was 10 years old and I should be able to drive the car. So I went out and started up the car and didn't know why it wouldn't go up the hill rather than down the hill. Screeched across the street and, land, and ended up underneath the lady next door's uh, hanging up clothes, and uh, I pull in right beside her and crash into the uh, the uh, the clothesline and put down the window. And she says, "That'll teach you to fool around with cars, young man." <laughs> Having worked in the hospitality industry in several restaurants in law school, I got to know the community really well. A lot of the leaders, um, the governor Thompson and his staff, used to come into some of the places I worked. Concord didn't change very much over the years. I left Concord in uh, 1947. We came back in 1956, uh, thereabouts. And of course, my dad used to own a store on uh, West Street, which was uh, the West Street Market or West Street Superette. And right next door to that, of course, was Janet's Donuts and all the activities that used to happen at uh, the West Street Ward House from the elections to any type of activity. I tried to be involved as I could while my children were small. I had a house full of seven boys and so I involved myself early on with the school districts and, and I was a ski club advisor and helping with um, any of the students' projects and the children as they grew. Concord Hospital was a very solid institution but the emergency room was like most, we had no emergency room doctors. So we all in our various specialties had to take our nights on call. So I might come in and see somebody with a broken leg or something else. 
We put it together, but it wasn't great, which is to say the Concord has evolved tremendously with ER doctors now. When we had our sleds growing up, they actually used to close off Downing Street. The city used to put wooden horses, and we used to be able to sled down Downing Street, and even uh, on School Street, we would carry our sleds all the way to School Street and the city would put wooden horses for the cars to be careful because there were kids on sleds coming down the hills. So between Center Street, School Street, I don't remember Warren Street being that way, but obviously that would never happen today. My husband was a merchant on Main Street, um, Edward Fine and his dad had the store, it was called Edward Fine and Son. We were married 49 years. You could, uh, and Pentecook was, was self-sufficient. You didn't have to go into the city of Concord uh, for anything because we had grocery stores, we had a meat market, we had two hardware stores, a jewelry store, a five and dime, a clothing store, a bank, a post office, a liquor store, a movie theater? Well, I moved to Pentecook about 20 years ago, and uh, Ward 1 is probably one of the nicest parts of the city, I believe. It's got all the advantages of living in a city, but it still maintains that feeling of being in a village, uh, that warmth, that feeling of knowing your neighbors, that true sense of community. With all the grocery stores that used to be, everybody had a neighborhood store back then. We didn't have uh, the giant supermarkets of the mall. We had uh, downtown, there was Mohegan Market, A&P, Concord Public Market, and the first national store. And they were all on Main Street in Concord. And then you got into the uh, little neighborhood stores and Concord had such a variety of small stores, including ours. I got involved in, in finishing law school. I got involved in democratic politics. I went out and got signatures for this governor of Georgia with a southern accent, uh, Jimmy Hu, who became governor or President Carter. And that was my first uh, venture into politics. And I ran for county attorney in 1982, ran for city council twice, learned that uh, you know, you really had, back then, had to be a hometown person with a good reputation. I was in my 30s and people didn't really know me. Um, I've stayed involved with uh, politics realizing and, and government realizing you don't have to be elected to take part. And after I retired, I became a substitute school teacher in the Merrimack Valley School District and worked there for four years until 2004 when I was fortunate enough to uh, be elected to the New Hampshire House to represent the people then of Wards 1, 2, and 3. Uh, unfortunately, the village uh, uh, things kind of dwindled and uh, for many, many years, obviously, we've had to go into Concord. I, as a city councilor, I did manage to save the library branch and everybody is very appreciative of that. Uh, up through June of 94, I was a teacher and had been for some 26 years. In the fall, I ran for school board and was elected, and by January of 95, just six short months later, I was a member of the Concord School Board. And I was a member for 14 years. My youngest son is a school teacher at Oyster River High School. He's a social studies teacher. He was in the audience, both, uh, both boys, uh, at Concord High School with the uh, Krista McAuliffe tragedy. I coached softball for uh, six years, and that's how my kids got introduced to softball at age 10 and 12. And they loved it, and it was a chance to really bond with them after all the traveling I'd done. And I uh, got to watch them grow up, and they wound up being captains of uh, college softball teams, you know. So it was a great experience for them, and it was a really good experience for me. Endicott Grill, and it was uh, located on Pleasant Street Extension. I don't know, the customers were great. We had the greatest customers of anybody in the city, I know. One of the things that's slightly less than positive was the destruction of the Boston Main Railroad Station down at the foot of Pleasant Street.
The railroad station came down as part of uh, urban renewal. And everybody at the time in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, was in love with the idea of having a shopping center. But it made perfect sense to our leadership at that time, and uh, that was a major change. I was a Kiwanis Club member. This meeting came up to support our poor little Kiwanis Club, which was large, but it had um, a very minimal program at that time. When suddenly they, they asked, I got a phone call asked me if I'd be willing to be the clerk, and I said yes, and then I got a phone call asking, there was vice president, sure, I, yes, I'll do that. Went to the meeting, and I was a, on, the, on the ballot for the president. So that's, I became president of the Kiwanis Club. Well, that we have had it as a city council priority uh, for some time to do the uh, to do a civic center. We called it a civic center back in, before we knew what we were trying to do. We weren't sure, but we wanted a central gathering place. We wanted initially it set out to be a hockey rink, and it ended up being a ball, a large ballroom. Simultaneously, I had opened uh, a dance school on 60 South State Street and I was just going to do this part-time while my children were growing up. However, it has evolved 34 years later. I'm still doing it and I still like it and um, I have seen probably a thousand families a year for the last 34 years. So the kids have grown up and they're gone and we have seven grandkids and of course grandkids are always great. My kids are all gone, they're all out of town now, it's just my wife and myself. Um, but retirement's not really uh, much of a rest, thankfully. My mother only passed, passed away only two years ago and we had five generations because three of the great grandchildren were born had been born and she was a great great grandmother and I do think that's pretty unusual in this uh, day and age. Later on in life I built sets for community players, so participated in the building of them here in Concord. And... Uh, I live about mm, five six miles from the Capitol it's a little drive out but so what uh, I can go out of the house at night on a January night and watch the media showers and if anybody's going by, they'll just say, oh, that crazy lazy's out there again. Service also has been important for me, and I joined Rotary Club um, eight years ago, and that's been a real wonderful opportunity to reach out in other ways to the city and the community. I found that, you know, I could, I could go around here and not worry about whether I left my car keys on the floor or not, or whether I had, had my grandchildren with me. Of course, it's, it's, it just was more of a relaxed atmosphere and more trusting atmosphere where we live. I'm blessed by living in Concord because when you're in politics, Concord offers so many opportunities to meet aspiring presidents and, and congressional aspirants. I mean, there's just so many opportunities. I just find that, I find it just interesting to be in a state where I can call a local radio station or local a television station and talk to the governor. I think that it's just the aspect of a very comfortable community to live in. Everybody kind of gets together in Concord, you know? It's more like a family than it is a town. I think that um, it's growing good in Concord. I hope we can maintain our small town atmosphere. I, I think my wishes for the future of the city of Concord uh, be that it continue to be of manageable size, a welcoming community where there are many opportunities for its citizens. I hope it doesn't get too big. You know, I think, uh, I think that right now it's, it's still the kind of community that you can go down to old fashioned bargain days and just say hi. To people. Uh, my hope is that Con Concord will continue to be as pleasant a place to live as it is now. Uh, that's not going to be easy because of the pressure that's been being brought to bear on uh, uh, congestion and uh, traffic and energy consumption. 
I would not like to see us become a metro area of Boston, even though it seems to be creeping up from Nashua, Manchester. If we can stay status quo, but yet grow. I would not care to see it grow to uh, uh, a substantial size, but I think the way it is now uh, with its parks and playgrounds, uh, that it, uh, it just provides wonderful opportunities for recreation. And uh, I would simply hope to see that the things that uh, make the city as pleasant a place to live as it is now. I like the growth. It's been not overwhelming, not out of control. It's been good. We look forward to businesses that can grow. I wish that it would be keep on the, the, the direction that's going in when it comes to culturally, and I think, and, and also what it's doing politically is it's putting out more different kinds of messages to other people across, across the country, and especially across New England. I think it's a leader, and people need to need to know that. As far as you know, a vision for the future, uh, I would like to see uh, Pentacle revitalized, and I feel that I've left it on the cusp of revitalization. And I am convinced that once we have a grocery store uh, near to the center of the village, uh, that other businesses will uh, crop up in downtown. Well, of course, the biggest thing for Pentecook, we'd love to eventually see a grocery store in Ward 1. But to, uh, to continue this mix of business and residential, uh, continuing to be a walking community, but a community where people are looking out and people volunteer, whether it's the village association or the historical society or the community center. It maintains this community where people are always looking to help their neighbor and uh, in being involved. Uh, that's what I'd like to see for Pentecost, maintain that small village charm that, we, uh, that makes us so special. I hope it'll only get better. I mean, people got kids to go to school and all that. And they got a good system now, I hope they keep it. Everywhere you go, the emphasis is on growth. I mean, when we lived in Houston, that city was growing so fast. When we moved there, uh, we lived outside the city limits, and by the time we left, eight years later, we were inside the city limits. It just expanded constantly. And as a result, I mean, we enjoyed our time there, but the city is just a huge amorphous thing. You know, it has no center and no heart to it. And um, Concord, Concord is still a small town, even though it's a state capital. And I hope it can con continue that uh, personality. Uh, I know everybody likes growth, and we like to add jobs and chicken processing plants and all this other stuff. But I hope we uh, um, we can contain it enough that we can still keep a, a local type of personality. It's not, we're losing those kind of places in this country. And um, I think Concord is pretty unique. One of the big pieces I think for me is to promote opportunities in all areas for the arts, uh, both stage, music, um, uh, painting and so on and so forth. Uh, and there's, a, there's great opportunities here to do that, but we should never give that up because these things are being taken out of the public school system for reasons that I won't discuss. But that's what really, I think, helps build character, is the opportunity to express yourself from inside. Well, I'm chairman of the Tax Increment Financing District and have been since 1998, trying to connect downtown to Commercial Street, to Page Building, to the Marriott. Just this summer, we have finally purchased every last parcel to be able to begin to connect to downtown. Because now with all the development in that area of all the way to Delta Dental through the tech and to connect to downtown. It's so funny, I was president of downtown for what was called Downtown Concord, Inc. And um, put together the market days for five, six years. and. Uh, we were all so frightened when that mall came that we couldn't hang on, that we couldn't still maintain our presence on Main Street. And interestingly, the mall's struggling now and Main Street's still going strong. I also hope that 
the local merchants will be able to survive in some way. I think all merchants are gonna be challenged by internet shopping, that's a fact, but somehow they have to become creative. So we have to keep that viable. We have to, we have to work with each other and know that I could go to the mall, maybe save $2, but I better start shop downtown so that we can have a beautiful downtown for all. And I think that uh, what they should do is take and get, promote more big businesses in this area. They're taking, uh, put more of the people here back in work. They, uh, um, I think they've done a pretty good job so far, but they could do more. That it provide uh, a variety of commercial occupations and commercial opportunities. Uh, that there be the opportunity, I think, to bring the Merrimack River more closely into Concord. I think that the river is just a marvelous asset and uh, one that I uh, think we should be able to tie more closely, as I say, to the city. I would hope that the city finds a way to make the waterfront part of the city of Concord more accessible to the residents of the city of Concord. That um, I know there's been talk of maybe someday putting a bridge across so that we can use the area on the other side of the river as a big park. And I think that would be a wonderful thing to do. I hope it would also grow in the educational opportunities that it, that it offers. We have a community college, we have branches of four-year colleges, and I would hope that, you know, that we would continue to grow uh, in, in that sense as well. A four-year college, I think that, uh, of course, we have our wonderful uh, NHTI Community College, and we have the Law Center, but I think, um, and it has been said that a four-year college in Concord would uh, really enhance uh, the city. I hope that Concord is always responsive to the needs of their taxpayers and all residents. Um, there are two things in life that are sure. One's death and the other one's taxes, but I'd add one other thing, and that's change. And if you look at uh, change over the years, just think about the school buildings and how they've changed. It's hard to give up the old traditions, the old buildings, the old streets, the old names, the old ways. But sometimes you're on the cusp of change and you have to open up your head and you know take the emotions and dampen them down a little bit and be open to change. Also to be open-minded about the incoming um, refugees that are coming to Concord now and are probably gonna to continue to come to help to fold them into the community and welcome them and understand that they have uh, an outlook on life that may not be ours, but still, in the broader sense, community needs to accept them. I hope that it will continue in that, in that path, and that's my wish too, by the way, that, that uh, things will continue to prosper as they are now, and that uh, my great-grandchildren uh, if they ever move to Concord, they're not in Concord now, but if they ever move to Concord, we'll enjoy it as much as I have. I, I hope it'll remain a safe place to, to live. I hope that we can do something for the homeless in, in Concord. Train service, more buses. They're adding two new buses every year. I, I wish that it could be as happy as I've had the experience, really. I have no complaints. What I would hope is that, that the municipal administrators and that the leaders and the common, ordinary, everyday blue-collar folks, everybody, just stays involved and try to come to some kind of consensus about what kind of change is appropriate.